anybody who would care to continue eating breakfast, please help themselves. Uh, my name is Maya McGinnis. I'm the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, and thank you so much on this grim and rainy day for braving the weather and coming out to join us, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, and the launch of this new project, U.S. Budget Watch. Anybody who studies deficits, and uh, pretty much that's all of you, because not that many other people come to big budget events in Washington, D.C. or any kind of deficit experts. But we're all familiar with the reasonably grim picture that the country currently faces. We have budget deficits that are back, structural, and uh, growing upward $400 billion a year and beyond. We have a social security system that's unsound, health care costs that are growing faster than the economy, putting pressure on the budget, on individuals, on employers. We have numerous tax issues that are outstanding and Congress has not yet dealt with them, uh, all resulting in a situation where we have a national debt that is unsustainable, growing at unsustainable rates. And I think there's no ifs, ands, or buts that if we fail as a country to face up to these issues, the future that we have is grim and we'll pay a price for it. Uh, accordingly, to help uh, the debt problem that we have in the country and to break this addiction of borrowing, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, the U.S. Budget Watch, are launching a 12-step recovery program. Uh, and the, the 12 principles for fiscal responsibility are part of this great new project uh, that we are combining with the Pew Charitable Trust to work on. The purpose of this whole project is going to be one to follow the big fiscal issues that affect the country during this election and beyond. Two, to provide voters with more information so that they can make informed choices as they're thinking about these issues in the coming uh, year. And three, I hope, to make fiscal responsibility cool. Um, I know, but, and, but I can't tell you how many times people come up to me and say, you really need to find a way to make the budget deficit sexy. Um, I don't think we're going to succeed at that, but I do guarantee you that we're going to succeed at shining the spotlight on the importance of these issues. Um, and I think really the biggest value that we'll be able to bring to this is a remarkable group of budget experts who make up the board of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. You have the whole bio list with you. Um, and what's truly special about this group is that while all of them who are here with us today and those of the others on the board um, have different views about the role of government, have different views about the specific policy solutions that we need to fix these problems, and all support different people for president. Uh, and to be clear, we will in no way be endorsing or supporting any candidates, uh, but they have come together and say it's absolutely important that we find a way to raise this issue and put it on the national agenda so that we don't go into the next uh, presidential cycle without some leadership on, on the really important issues. So without further ado, I am so pleased that we have a wonderful group of board members here today to talk about these issues and principles. You have the detailed bios, um, but we're going to hear from Leon Panetta and Bill Frenzel, who are both the co-chairmen of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, Chuck Bowser, Rudy Petter, Congressman Charlie Stenholm, Congressman Jim Colby, Dean Sterling, and Bill Hoagland. Um, who will all be talking about this project and the different parts of it, the different parts of, uh, of the principal's paper, and the reasons they think this issue matters so much, and then we'll have time for questions and answers from the audience. So once again, um, I hope that the 12 steps can have some impact, and thanks so much for joining us. Leon. Good, thank you very much, uh, Maya. And, uh, welcome to all of you uh, to this hopeful effort to try to bring uh, the budget crisis to the attention of the American people as well as the candidates for president uh, so that uh, something can be done to face what we think is an urgent crisis. Uh, it's a project of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget and the committee, for those of you that are not familiar with it, uh, was established soon after the Budget Act was passed in 1974 it was a bipartisan group. It always has been a bipartisan group, largely made up of former members of Congress who worked with the budget and while they served in the Congress, uh, former heads of the OMB, CBO, uh, and the GAO, as well as former staff and party leaders concerned about the issue of a budget process and budget discipline. Uh, the purpose has always been of this committee to try to encourage uh, fiscal discipline and to try to get Congress to adhere to the budget process and to try to implement those budget principles that will produce budget discipline and hopefully a reduced federal budget, if not a balanced budget. Uh, the 
members of this, the many of the members of this group, uh, and I as chair of the budget committee and as head of OMB, have often met with this committee in past days who provided criticisms, who provided warnings, who provided guidance and help in trying to deal with budget issues. And so I appreciate the fact that now we come together in an effort to try to bring these issues to the attention of the presidential candidates and to the public so that they recognize the serious budget crisis that's facing this nation. Uh, I often tell my students, and I often say that we govern in our democracy through leadership or through crisis. If you look at the history of the budget process, it is a history in which there have been those who have been willing to lead and to make tough decisions, and those who have not been willing to lead and allow crisis to basically drive budget policy. Uh, when you look at the history of the budget process, actually the first 20, 25 years of that process, there's been some remarkable success. It's ups and downs, the roller coaster ride, but uh, there has been uh, some, some success. There were early part of the budget process, there actually were bipartisan budgets that were agreed to by Democrats and Republicans working together. Uh, there was the Reagan budget in the past, which was enormous in terms of what it provided in reconciliation for the first time Congress enacted reconciliation in those years to produce budget savings, the first time we actually implemented the reconciliation process. Uh, we then, it led to a series of budget summits uh, in the Reagan years and in the Bush years, uh, and culminated with the 90 budget agreement uh, that uh, provided for almost $500 billion in deficit reduction, uh, roughly split between uh, revenues and spending restraints, uh, as well as included some very important budget enforcement tools, uh, PAYGO, uh, caps on discretionary spending. The Clinton budget reflected uh, a, a lot of what was in the 90 budget agreement. It was 500 billion in deficit reduction and also included those enforcement And then ultimately in 1997, there was a balanced budget agreement between the President and Congress that locked in a lot of those decisions that had been made in prior agreements. I think it's fair to say, having participated in most of those efforts, that although there were, there were differences, although there were party differences in terms of uh, what ought to be in or out of the budget, uh, there were substantive debates that often took place, that I, it's fair to say that both parties had a commitment to fiscal responsibility and fiscal restraint, and both parties had a commitment to balancing the budget. In the last eight years, I think it's fair to say that that commitment has largely been ignored. The budget process on Capitol Hill is today largely dysfunctional. Uh, and, and, and it is not being implemented and enforced, certainly, in accord with the, uh, the goals that were established in the Budget Act of 74. While there have been efforts, obviously, to try to develop restraint in the Congress. They are, they are always met by partisan opposition and gridlock. And so the result of that, you don't have the leadership, then obviously you have the crisis. And Maya referred to that, and we'll hear it from other members here. The crisis is serious. We're looking at record deficits, $400 billion. The likelihood is it will go to $500 billion because of what's happening in the economy. Uh, in addition to that, uh, and although some would excuse the size of that deficit relevant to our economy, the reality is when, when you lock it in with the long-term problems that we're facing, particularly in entitlement programs, it becomes a huge crisis uh, in these next few years. There was a headline in a paper yesterday that said that uh, we are looking at a record $57.3 trillion in federal liabilities to cover benefits. Uh, for individuals, largely, obviously, in the entitlement area. Uh, healthcare costs are exploding. There are a number of tax issues out there uh, involving whether we extend the tax cuts or try to deal with the AFT uh, that are going to perhaps add as much as another trillion dollars to the deficit. Uh, we are in what I would call a borrow and spend spiral right now to try to confront these issues. 
And there's a price to be paid. And that's, I guess, what we'd really like to bring to the attention of the people in Canada. So the price is that ultimately we will not have the resources. Whoever is president will not have the resources to confront whatever their priorities are, whether it's defense, whether it's social spending, they simply will not have the resources. All capital will be absorbed by virtue of that huge debt that we're facing. Uh, we'll be dependent uh, on foreign lenders in order to try to make it from day to day. And I think in the end, it will reduce our living standards in this country. And perhaps worst of all is that we increase the most regressive tax, which is the tax on our children. We're ultimately going to have to pay that debt. The next president has a choice. And the choice is a clear one. Whether you continue this spiral of borrow and spend uh, and continue to try to take the easy way in dealing with these issues and pass this debt on to the future, or whether you make the hard decisions that have to be made and try to really uh, put fiscal responsibility in place. The fear we all have is that the candidates are not really addressing this issue. Uh, they're talking about the tax cuts they're for, they're talking about the spending they're for, some have suggested that uh, the cost of that will be covered, but when you really look at what they're proposing for spending, savings, it doesn't really add up to cover the cost. And that's what concerns us. So, for us on this committee, we think in the end, the president really has no choice. Uh, the president is going to have to deal with this issue, because if he fails to deal with this issue, he or she fails to deal with this issue then I think they'll have a failed presidency. And so that's why it's important to take this issue on, uh, because it needs to have a clear mandate from the, from the public that it's important to address this issue. We put forward 12 principles for fiscal responsibility. Those are principles all of us have worked with over the years. We think they're important to the effort to reduce uh, the deficit. They will help voters better understand this issue and challenge the candidates and they will help candidates try to speak directly and honestly to the challenge that faces us. Uh, I realize there are a lot of serious crises that a new president is going to have to face. We all do. Two wars, global warming, health care, uh, immigration issues, issues related to uh, uh, energy, uh, issues related to uh, education. But I have to tell you, unless the next president is willing to confront this issue, they will not have the resources to deal with any of the other crises. And that's the point that we would like to make today to the President of the candidates and the American people. Leanne, thank you so much. Just I have to point out that in your unique role as having served as the Chairman of the Budget Committee, Head of OMB, and Chief of Staff at the White House, you really have sort of seen this from all angles. And, uh, and the complexities that are involved, you're one of the, the best experts and assets that we have because of that. Um, Bill Frenzel, the other co-chairman of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Thank you, Maya. Uh, welcome to the Committee for a Responsible Federal <laughs> Budget, and welcome to our oxymoronic world. <laughs> we are a group of individuals, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents, with an abiding interest responsible budget fiscal policy. Leon explain to you where we come from and what our past experience is, uh, but all together we are all veterans scarred in the budget wars somewhere. Uh, we know that it isn't easy to make policies that are fiscally sound because we didn't do such a damn brilliant job of it when we were there either. We're committed to be helpful to today's policy makers, and, and that has been our history. Our traditional role has been to offer advice, particularly to the budget committee. Uh, despite the high quality of that council, uh, the budget committees have uh, regularly rejected our <laughs> splendid advice, and have more often, particularly as Leon pointed out recently, uh, produced more fiscal inebriation than fiscal sobriety. So today, when, as we kick off the Budget Watch program, we're shifting our focus to the election campaign. We're still going to work with the budget committees and try to encourage them to uh, good conduct. But uh, in this new approach, in the election approach, we're going to try to encourage candidates to, uh, 
to first of all acknowledge the problem rather than, than take the uh, usual Alfred E. Newman approach and to speak honestly to that problem and to explain how they'll deal with, maybe even solve, uh, some of the problems. Now, what we expect from our candidates is, is not altogether certain at this moment. We know that they're not going to uh, make pronouncements in exquisite detail, and that we're not going to have a lot of volunteers uh, uh, stepping forward to trump on the best interests of their core constituents. On the other hand, we do expect them to acknowledge the problem, to lay out goals to uh, achieve uh, at least long-term success, to, uh, to uh, establish features that uh, are checkable and uh, that we can work with in the future. And uh, we hope them to, we hope that they'll be able to establish mandates as well. Uh, we can get into this in a little bit uh, more detail later, uh, but uh, when we have information from the candidates, we will analyze and evaluate their program. And we will describe to the public what we think are going to be the fiscal results of those programs. And we're going to want to know uh, what is it going to cost and where the money is coming from. Again, not in exquisite detail, but uh, with some specificity. Now, what the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget brings to this party is some real life experience in the budget arena and some bipartisanship with diversity. We don't agree on the solution. We do agree on the problems. The reason that we stay on budget policy is not because we are budget one, but because we are terrified by what we see lying before us and our children and our grandchildren. We do agree that the fiscal problem has to be solved by making difficult decisions from the widest range of alternatives in negotiations between the competing parties. That's what the Budget Watch program is supposed to help us accomplish. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Chuck. Uh, thanks very much. It's hard to follow two congressmen here, being an accountant, you know, uh, <laughs> But anyway, I was assigned a couple areas, and one is the national debt. In other words, I think when you get the big volumes every year from the president, uh, for the average person, it's very hard to wade through that. For those of us who have waded through it many times, it's even difficult. But the one page I always go to is the national debt. And uh, in 1980, our national debt was $900 billion. And that was, if you think about it, after all the wars in this uh, century, or the past century, the, re the Great Depression, the various recessions, the SNL crisis, and things like that. Uh, and so, uh, it was 900 billion. Today it is 10.4 trillion at the end of uh, fiscal year, estimated at the end of fiscal year uh, 2009. And there's real consequences of uh, this huge run up in debt. Uh, in uh, 1980, if you remember, our interest rates were running 10, 12, 14 percent. That was our great inflation, which Paul Volcker eventually licked. But, uh, but the uh, interest rates were running about 10%. So uh, we were paying out interest of um, uh, $90 billion, um, $70 billion at that time, which was about 10% of the debt. We are now uh, paying out, uh, on a gross basis, close to uh, half a trillion dollars, but half of that goes as a booking for that entry to the Social Security and other trust funds. Now that's, a lot of people think, just a bookkeeping entry, we shouldn't worry too much about it. But in a few years, the people that um, uh, paid into that are going to uh, wonder and be asking for some of that money back. Uh, our net is 260, but that's much lower than normal because we're now paying a lot of people only 2% to 3% on government bonds on interest, which isn't really fair uh, to the people who are buying government bonds, including a lot of retirees and a lot of people will receive because it really doesn't even match the current inflation rate. So the interest costs could zoom, really, 
up to uh, twice what it is today uh, without any trouble if we get into any real inflation, which it looks like we could be. Now, I think the other thing, too, that's interesting is, you know, we have a gene down the road here is going to talk about some of the myths of budgeting, but I think one of the great myths is some supply-side economics. Uh, Senator Moynihan used to refer to that as a great political theory, not an economic theory. And, uh, and I think he's it right. It especially doesn't work when you run into some really big spending issues after you've got the tax cuts enacted. And of course, nothing uh, illustrates this better than war. And when you go to war, war is costly. Uh, when I just came here 40 years ago, I was one of the last member, you might say, of presidential appointees of McNamara's staff. And coming out of the Midwest, I thought McNamara was right on top of that uh, defense budget because he had such good publicity on his PPBS and everything like that. But the truth of the matter is, once he went into the Vietnam War, he lost control of the defense budget. And it went from 40 billion to 80 billion. And the uh, services were asking for 120 billion uh, to replenish you know, all their weapons and everything like that. Well, that's exactly what's happened this time. In other words, uh, the, uh, the um, budget for uh, defense, uh, when this administration started in 19, uh, in 2000, 2001, was about 300 billion. Now it's well over 600 billion, going to 700 billion. It doubled the same as it did in the Vietnam War. Uh, and, uh, and that's true of all wars. In other words, you, have, you run up huge debts at that time. So if you're not willing to adjust your tax policy, uh, and, and President Johnson wasn't in the Vietnam War, President Bush was not in during this time, well, you, you really uh, run up large debts, and of course that's where we're at. So I think we uh, basically have, as both Leon and Bill point out here, we have a huge problem here. There's going to be a big debate for the president's mind, the new president, 2009, just as there always is when we have a big crisis. And, uh, and the financial issues uh, have to be uh, front and center. And uh, if you're going to stay in the war, if you're going to uh, uh, stay there and spend this kind of money, I can tell you you're going to add several trillion dollars uh, to the debt. And with the dollar sinking uh, as it has, with our financial institutions in terrible shape right now, if, if they were not, they're on life support from the uh, Federal Reserve and the central banks uh, around the world. And so we, we are handing over to the new administration really some very serious problems. And so I think they've got to look at the short-term problems, which basically is the cost of war, the implications of these war costs, the revenue side of the budget, and then you got to look at the long-term issues, which are uh, health care and Social Security. And if you think about it, interest, Social Security, health care, defense, they make up 75 to 80 percent of the federal budget. So you got, but I think you have to look at these two short-term ones just as much as you have to look at the long-term ones. And I think that's going to be the, the big debate here. Hopefully, hopefully, the incoming uh, Congress and the incoming administrations will recognize this and try to get us back to a much better uh, sound fiscal basis. Because if they don't, I think we can have real crisis. Right now, I think the crisis we're facing in the private sector with the banks, the big broker dealers, uh, the inflation that is starting to come in, and the fact that we've used up now two thirds of the assets over the Federal Reserve to uh, exchange for what one of the newspaper articles said over the weekend, they exchange the crash for the cash. That means uh, uh, securities that you can't even sell are being delivered to the central bank and can't get uh, good treasury uh, documents in return. But we've got all of this building up, and this is the biggest crisis since World War II. It could morph into being the biggest crisis since the Great Depression. We're not there yet, but it certainly could head that way if we don't handle it right here, I think, in the next 12 or 24 months. So with that rosy uh, analysis, I will now turn it on to the next speaker. Thanks, Chuck. And you have to take it all the more seriously when uh, you're hearing the message from the former head auditor and accountant for the entire country. So thanks for your message. Uh, Rudy Penner, who is the former director of the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, thank you, Maya. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the tax side of this equation. And actually, here the candidates have said an awful lot more than they've said about the spending 
challenges that so uh, so disturbed this committee. Uh, Senators Clinton and Obama have a long laundry list of targeted tax benefits. They would extend the Bush tax cuts to the middle class and below. And there are, and they would, while well, ending them for the rich, you know, there are vaguer hints about even more uh, tax uh, taxes at the top. Uh, Senator McCain would extend all the Bush tax cuts, add some more, and have the radical proposal to allow people to choose between filing under the current system and uh, some new simplified flatter tax. But as I read the public opinion polling concerning the tax system, I think much of the campaign misses the basic point. And that is that the general public thinks our current tax system is just terribly unfair. Uh, there's a strong belief that the rich can pretty much avoid a major tax burden. And that is why so many players favor a flat tax. They think the rich would actually pay more uh, if we could get rid of the horrendous complexity of the current system. Now, while those of us who study the tax system know that, in fact, the rich pay a very, very high burden, uh, we also know that there are enough rich people who escape to uh, cause very, uh, to raise very little legitimate concern. Everybody seems to have an uncle or cousin who makes more income but pays less tax than they do. Uh, indeed, the variance of the tax burden within income groups just extraordinary. Uh, now, I don't think that most Americans believe that uh, fairness implies taxing the deceivers out of rich people. Uh, it just means that the tax burden should be more uniform within income groups and that the affluent should take somewhat higher burden uh, than the less affluent. As we look at the fiscal challenges that loom ahead, it's hard to imagine a bipartisan solution that does not ask a large number of Americans, not only the rich, to endure a higher tax burden than today. Although as a more conservative type, I'd like to see the tax increase minimized. But the basic problem is that it's very hard to see the American people accepting a higher burden unless their view of the fairness of the tax system improves. I'm not even sure they'll accept rhetoric about taxing the rich if they think the rich can easily avoid taxes. Uh, to me, it's a situation that just cries out for fundamental tax reform. Uh, that would be true if, if, even if it weren't necessary to deal with the alternative minimum tax and the expiration of the Bush tax cut. But add those two complications, and the environment for fundamental tax reform should be about as propitious as it has ever been. Now we saw in 1986 that any such reform takes both presidential and bipartisan congressional leadership. And it has to be admitted uh, that it's going to be hard to duplicate the trio of Reagan, Rosenkowski, and Packwood. Uh, but that's the kind of effort that's required. Uh, would that we would hear more from the candidates that they think that fundamental reform is needed, if so, how they go about it, not the details, mind you, but the process and the general outline. It would be a lot better than debating the merits of a gas tax holiday. Now, I was also asked to talk about the whole rest of the budget, uh, but given the progress of the Ag Bill, that's just too depressing. <laughs> 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 I was asked to talk, talk about Social Security and particularly the reforms uh, that uh, some of us have felt have been necessary for quite some time. I came across a testimony that I gave before the Ways and Means Committee in February of 1983. And I could recite the same suggestions today that we did back in 1983. We made a few of them, but uh, not nearly enough. You know, I'm, uh, I had the privilege of what, representing the 17th District of Texas doing so, I had a, a, quite a few folks with what we call an evil West Texas track to see the common sense approach to some of this. And I, I don't remember how I come to get involved in Social Security and budget issues. My being an Aggie and uh, on the Ag Committee and an Ag teacher and farmer uh, professor. But I did in uh, healthcare, uh, 
with rural health care concerns and issues there. But uh, as we started looking at it, uh, I said back in 1983, I quoted Frank Bain, who was the original uh, architect of the Social Security system, uh, working when it was first put together, when he said, and I use this uh, many times, and Jim Colby and I, we began to work together. Frank Bain said, I made a mistake. If I had to do over again, I would make several changes. I believe old man Solomon. He didn't know what he was talking about. Three score years and 10, he was way off base. I would change the age situation. Instead of three score and 10, I would make it four score and 10. Ah, I agreed with that in 1983. Uh, and uh, every, when I finally started having opponents, uh, they took issue with me. But uh, most of the people understood that the Social Security system with a 65 year retirement age would not make sense in 2005. And we did make an adjustment in 1986 and gradually began moving the age in which you can draw your Social Security to age 68. Now, Jim and I, when we put together our first uh, bipartisan bicameral bill, we suggested 70. But uh, we didn't pick up very many co-sponsors of the brilliant idea that, uh, that we had, not Jim and I, but we had some help from some other folks on this uh, table back in the early 1980s. Jim came to me one day, we were serving on the budget committee, and he said, Charlie, I've got this idea about a public pension reform caucus. Knowing then, in the early 80s, that we were, had some challenges ahead, he explained it to me, and, you know, he was the token Republican at that time, I was the Democrat in the majority. It was the Stenholm Kobe bill until it became the Kobe Stenholm bill. But every year we started looking at the necessity and, and some of the things we agreed on in reform. If you're going to reform anything, but particularly Social Security, you have to put everything on the table. You can't exclude anything from discussion. If you do, you will never get there. President Bush proved that uh, with, with his approach, even though I personally agreed with that early on. Uh, and Jim and I in the bill. But you've got to put everything on the table, and that means that you have got to say to those who are drawing now Social Security, you may not be able to draw as much in the future as you are today, unless the Congress is willing to pass the taxes on to the young people of the future in order to do that which you are being promised today. Now that's tough to do in a political campaign, and that's why the work that uh, Jim and I, which began with the Center for Strategic and International Studies, that put together some folks on this table right here, uh, that, uh, that came up with a pretty good idea. Now Jim started out believing in privatizing Social Security. Uh, I didn't, uh, but we ended up on a compromise, what's called individual account. I still think it is a wonderful idea for reform of Social Security. Telling young people today, we're going to have a little change in the manner in which you will draw your Social Security in the future. Telling them, it's, it kind of amounts to the ice cream after you've forced them to eat their spinach, which is what's going to ultimately have to happen on Social Security reform. But we've, uh, we've had a few uh, interesting years since 1983 in attempting to reform the age, uh, you know, today, the average life expectancy of we the American people is now on the average about 77, 78. What makes anyone believe that you could still have a system based on now 68 in which you draw the benefits? What makes anyone believe that? You know, I, I, I like to quote, uh, when we start talking about philosophy, I like to quote Yogi Berra when he says, that which can't go on usually won't. <laughs> and, and another one that we've used in attempting to reform Social Security over the years, it, I'm sure here it's either Garfield or Confucius, that said when you find yourself in a hole, the first rule is to quit digging. Well, when we start talking about reform in the budget process, reform in the Social Security, you've got to quit digging before you can start building and try to dig yourself out of the hole. And uh, the other one I love, and boy, this is so applicable for Social Security when we start talking about Social Security reform. And that was Will Rogers when he said, it ain't people's ignorance that bothers me so much. It's them knowing so much that ain't so is the problem. <laughs> and you know, that perfectly describes the challenges that Jim and I had over the years when we had a bipartisan Democrat and Republican. He had one or two Republicans that would agree with him. I had maybe I could stretch it to Alan Boyd uh, is the, the one remaining now uh, on the idea that uh, we put forward. Uh, 
But uh, it's been difficult to do. We came close in the first years of the Clinton administration. We came so close uh, to actually doing a meaningful reform, but you know the rest of the story on that one. But I conclude by just saying that most everyone knows that you've got to make some changes. It's the political followership that we have got to work on. We've we have got to find a little better way, and that's why this project is attempting to get those who would be the next president of the United States take a look at the challenges that we have, and as was said before, not specific recommendations, but set the tone so that, in fact, uh, when the next Colby Stenholm bill gets on the floor of the House, that we'll have a chance of getting 218 votes, or really 270 or 80 votes, because nothing will ever happen on Social Security or any of the other meaningful issues except in a bipartisan way. And I would conclude by saying that's why I so much be appreciated the years that I had the privilege of working with Jim as we talked to so many groups and worked with so many different individuals, both in Congress and out, in trying to set that stage, but as was said earlier, we failed. Thank you very much, Charlie Jim. Well, if, if it weren't for the fact that Maya wanted to have this great, nice 12-step program, there might have been a 13th principle we could have added here. Certainly there's a corollary that overlays all of these, and that is that there has to be bipartisanship in order to achieve any of this. We heard at the outset two very great members of Congress, one Democrat, one Republican, the yeah, other Bill Frenzel. You heard Charlie Stenholm, a Democrat, talking about Social Security reform. He and I, I, Republican, worked together on that proposal. Now, we didn't get very far uh, with it. But I think it's very clear that even putting forth something like that requires bipartisanship. Uh, one of the candidates for, for president can certainly endorse these principles, but implementing them and actually achieving the kinds of budget reforms we're talking about is absolutely positively going to require bipartisanship on Capitol Hill. And I say that knowing that the, the like very strong likelihood, of course, is that the Democrats are going to have a majority, an enhanced majority in the Congress, and a very good possibility that they will have the White House as well. I don't care if all three of the branches are held by one party, as we've had for several years here in this last administration on the other side. It still requires bipartisanship for this to happen. Now, bipartisanship isn't easy. You don't get any points for it. You don't win any kudos for it. For one thing, party your party faithful don't really like it. They want red meat thrown out there. For another thing, the media doesn't like it. It's too boring. It doesn't have conflict you know, in, involved. And so there's not a lot of rewards that you get for doing something on a bipartisan basis. But from a practical standpoint, in terms of getting legislation passed and being able to achieve the kinds of really hard reforms we're talking about require a lot of very hard lifting and it required to require a lot of very hard sacrifices and difficult choices to be made on both sides of the political spectrum. It absolutely is going to take that kind of bipartisanship. So the message here today, I think, one of them has to be that while we want all the candidates to, for president to endorse this, we also are going to have to seek this kind of bipartisanship in the Congress of the United States. We're going to have to look to get make sure that there are people on the Republican and the Democrat side of the aisles that will endorse these kinds of principles and will work the implement. This is becoming increasingly difficult over the years as we've seen the polarization that has taken place in Congress. We can have a nice discussion here this morning someplace else about why that has occurred and what, what chances we have of reversing that. But we absolutely must reverse it in this case if we're going to have the kind of budget reforms that are going to be meaningful and that are going to last and they're going to do something serious for our children and our grandchildren. Thanks, Jim. And one certainly has to hold up the work that you and Charlie have done together as a model, minus the one part that you never got passed. But otherwise, it's a perfect model for how we'd like to see people come together. Uh, Steve Sterling. An angry member of Parliament once shouted at Benjamin Disraeli, Sir, you will either die on the gallows are of an unspeakable disease. To which Disraeli responded, that depends, sir, upon whether I embrace your policies or your mistress. <laughs> 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 Mr. 
my job is so easy. I'm here to talk about the myths that prevent us uh, from embracing uh, the policies that we have to uh, undertake. And indeed, it, it just put it on the opposite side. Uh, the myths are, in some sense, the mistress of an action, a failure to deal, deal with, with the budget deficit. So what are some of these myths? And I should indicate that we're not the only group to put out myths. The uh, so-called Gang of 16 that put out a, a, a taking back our fiscal future brochure basically spoke to some of these myths as well. That involved people from every uh, side of the political aisle and almost every major uh, uh, institution here in town, including uh, such people as Rudy Mai and myself as well. So what's the first bit that we have to dispel? Well, that's the deficits don't matter. Now, of course, it's possible that in some short periods of time, a deficit may be a useful tool of macroeconomic policy, but that's only if it's offset later by a surplus to pay for it. And in fact, I think the way we should record the deficit of the budget, if we were honest, is nothing more than a tax on the future generations to which we have not yet assessed who's going to pay. So to say that we deficits don't matter is like saying if we spend $100,000 a year on our consumption and we make $80,000 in wages and we leave the credit card to our debt, to our children, that that doesn't matter. It's silly. Deficits matter. They are a bill and they have to be paid. But what's another myth that's starting to circulate now? Well, it's that, well, the issue is really health care. We don't really need to worry too much about anything else like aging. Now, it's true that if you take the compound growth rates of Medicare and Medicaid, and you project them out far enough into the future, soon they dominate everything else because the growth rate is so high. But in the near term, and I'm talking about the next 10 or 15 years, it's actually the absolute growth of programs like Social Security that's much larger than the actual growth in, in Medicare and Medicaid. Moreover, we're not exactly sure whether all of these projections in Medicare and Medicaid are accurate, whereas the Social Security projections are pretty accurate because they're based upon uh, demographics. And finally, I'll leave you just with another statistic here to think about this. We're soon going to a world where close to one-third of adults are scheduled to be on Social Security. Close to one-third of adults. You know, when government starts deciding that everybody needs to be taken care of, it really can't take care of anybody very well. And so this aging issue, including the healthcare side of the aging issue, because it's really an interactive issue, is something we have to deal with. We have to figure out how, among other things, to get more workers uh, to work to pay the taxes we need to support our health care system. What's well, another myth? Well, one of them is that tax cuts pay for themselves. Uh, we've already heard that the supply side, extreme supply side economics, in the sense that taxes pay for themselves, doesn't, doesn't make much sense. But this relates closely to the notion that deficits don't matter. If you have a tax cut and you don't pay for it, that is, if you don't pay for it through a spending reduction, then it's nothing more than a tax increase of someone in the future. You're just leaving another deficit to be paid for uh, by, by, by someone, someone else. Now, it's true if tax rates are 100%, you reduce them to 99%, you might get the non-working population to work. But it's not true that if you reduce tax rates from 1% to 0%, that taxes will go up. Tax cuts in general uh, do not pay for themselves. They can provide sharp rent stimulus, but initially, if you haven't paid for them and you have a tax increase in the future, you've done nothing to improve the economy. <coughs> well, what's another myth? Well, that is that we can close the budget gap uh, simply by reducing wasteful spending or cracking down on tax evasion. Now, it's true, there's waste, there's fraud, there's abuse, and certainly we shouldn't go after it. There's no study that comes close to talking about the hundreds of billions the trillions of dollars of future obligations that we've uh, uh, made to the public simply by getting rid of waste, fraud, and abuse. And a harder side of this issue, and one that I think also goes back to this health care debate, is the notion that we can just go after this health care that's of no benefit whatsoever to anyone. We're just going to remove that part of the health care system, and then we, we, can, we can afford it. It's simply not true, because there's a lot of health care that's worth very little of the dollar, or if you want to, it's worth much less than if we put money into something like education for our kids or other needs of society. Another myth, some policies are so important that we shouldn't uh, have to uh, pay for them. Well, as I've indicated several other ways, well, you always have to pay. You always have to pay. If you have a running deficit, you have a tax cut, you have a spending increase, you pay for it. The government runs on a balance sheet, and there's always two sides of the balance sheet, and uh, uh, the trade-offs are inevitable. But one thing I'd like to add in the previous discussion, too, this is not just an issue of deficits and, and 
long-term liabilities. If you look closely at the budget now, the squeeze is taking place now. The growth in the programs we're talking about, mainly the retirement health programs, are putting an extraordinary squeeze on programs for children, on infrastructure development, all of the, mainly the functions of government that are identified in the Constitution. These programs are getting squeezed now. They're not waiting for some, um, some future day. Well, maybe we'll get lucky in terms of our final myth and we can grow our way out of this problem. Well, what's unique today in all of the nation's history is you can't really grow your way out of the problem. You can actually grow your way out of the Louisiana Purchase. You can actually grow your way out of the debt from a war time because we largely had a discretionary budget. And as long as revenues grew with the economy, at some point in the distant future, they would exceed the level of obligations you had in these discretionary programs. What we now have in these automatically growing programs is growth rates in spending that are higher than the growth rates in revenues. And you never catch up. And if the economy grows faster, these programs are actually designed so that they grow faster when the economy grows faster. So, for instance, if you have wage index and social security, wages go up by an extra 1%, the benefits go up by an extra 1%. In healthcare, the economy grows a little stronger, we get higher income, we demand even more health care. That's the dilemma, is that these programs are scheduled to grow ever faster than the economy and the revenues, and so you can't make these myths. So you don't need to be a genius to understand that these myths are merely excuses for not dealing with the deficit. You know, uh, uh, one of our famous Washingtonians, Joe Theismann, wants to find a genius. He said, you know, you don't need to be a genius to be able to understand football. A genius is someone like Norman, Einstein. <laughs> I, uh, I noticed on the uh, marquee announcing this event that uh, everyone up here is honorable except for Gene and myself, and that's a misprint for Gene because I think he uh, qualifies under Assistant Secretary of Treasury at one point. So it's probably appropriate that uh, Maya asked that this not honorable person at this end here, but to speak about gimmicks. And uh, <laughs> I presume it also has something to do with the fact that she might think that I had helped uh, invent a few of them along the way. <laughs> and that uh, uh, I'm here to pay public uh, penance. Uh, the former uh, uh, Senator Phil Graham used to like to quip that uh, balancing the budget uh, is like going to heaven. Everyone uh, wants to do it. They just don't want to make the journey. Um, I guess the temptation, the temptation for politicians to err um, in, the, in, in making that journey, uh, to go off uh, shaded facts a little bit, uh, is completely understandable. It is a difficult journey. Uh, but it's also, I think, a sad state of affairs when an organization such as the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget has to list as one of its principles for the candidates, be honest. Uh, it seems obvious what self-respecting candidate politician is uh, running for higher office is going to go out there and adopt a magic asterisk for uh, unspecified future savings in the future to meet his fiscal plan. Uh, what self-respecting uh, politician is going to count the 2010 census as something that was unexpected and therefore an emergency uh, not to be counted? And, there, and, and what uh, politician is going to go ahead and slip a few paydays back and forth between uh, uh, September the 30th to October the 1st? Or use, uh, with all due respect, Charlie, uh, or use an outdated uh, farm bill baseline so they could avoid the pay go points of order in the current uh, deliberations. Now, no, the, those gimmicks aren't going to be displayed in any kind of uh, debates and campaign debates. I, I more worry about uh, some of the subtle natures of gimmicks in a campaign season. And that is, a, and they may fall a little bit into the myth category that Gene talked about. Investments are not spending. Uh, revenue enhancement are not tax increases. Trust funds are to be trusted. 
eliminating earmarks will solve the problem. A constitutional amendment is all that we really need. I think the American public, and I think a number of the press that are here, fully understand this. We have to give credit to the American public out there that they understand this more than that. Be honest with the politicians. The politicians need to be honest with the American public going into this campaign season. Finally, on the process, uh, I was asked to say a couple words. Over two decades ago, uh, Rudy Kenner here nailed it, and uh, there's no way to prove upon it. When he said the process is not the problem, the problem is the problem. He can't prove upon that after nearly two decades. But if anything, maybe uh, by trying to fix this process over the years, we may have uh, contributed with the usual unintended consequences of making the process more complex and confusing, and that has led to the genesis of some of these criticisms that have undermined the process and, in fact, elevated these issues of eugenics and therefore have lost the trust in the process to be an honest and fair broker. So while it is uh, not the solution this rec one of the recommendations here from the committee is that uh, we should at least put the process on the discussion. Uh, it is not sexy. It's not uh, something that's going to grab a lot of folks out there. But it does seem to me that we should be willing to the next politicians, the next elected officials, the next president, the next Congress, should be willing to look at this whole process top down, simplification, streamlining. Uh, I uh, also think, and uh, James uh, had an observation a few years back that uh, stuck with me when he observed that uh, never in the nation's history have so many dead and retired officials been able to exert such control over the current and future budgets. It's never been that's so true and so part of the need for reform of the process, it seems to me, is to prevent today's politicians or those who wish to become elected officials in the next Congress from contributing to the future fiscal problems by postponing and delaying and kicking down the road a number of these issues. In the words of Charles Stenholm, stop digging the hole. Thank you so much. Um, thank you immensely to all of our panelists. I think it's clear to everybody in the audience why bringing this group together of um, very impressive people, we hope will, will help to focus attention on these issues. Um, I'm gonna do something that no good moderator or lawyer should ever do, which is ask a question that I don't know what the answer is, I don't even know if there will be a single answer, but I'm desperately gonna try to lighten the mood uh, before we open up for Q&A, and just ask, is there any good news out there? <laughs> Somebody think of something. Uh, <laughs>
And he always said that, you know, a lot of people think that the House members shouldn't have to run every two years. It's a terrific burden. And it is a terrific burden. <laughs> it sure is that money running every two years. But as he said during the Vietnam War, as meant to uprising as we had by uh, the young people of this country and then eventually the old people in this country, why it was the fact that we had elections coming every two years that at least kept um, the uh, uprising to something that could be uh, tolerated until we got to the next election and eventually just people spoke. And I think that's what's coming myself. Okay. Oh, <laughs> One of the, uh, I think, effective budget rules stemming from the 1990 uh, Andrews Air Force Base Summit Budget Enforcement Act of 90 was a rule I call pay as you go, pay go. I think the effort of the Democrat majority in the House to reinstate and to stay with pay go. <coughs> Uh, has been admirable. Uh, they've been run out of town and they're going to be run out of town again. And they're not going to be able to hold it. Nevertheless, the, the very fact that they tried very hard and uh, held it as an important goal, I think it has been the best news in the last two years. Um, I think there's uh, more and more understanding out there amongst the public that uh, the situation is unsustainable. I guess Charlie called it tractor seat wisdom. Uh, I think there's an awful lot of that out there and if we can exploit it. Uh, all we have to do is learn how to explain it to newspaper reports. <laughs> <laughs> Jim. I think Rudy is right about the uh, growing understanding of this, and I put that together with the fact that I think the good news is this is an incredibly strong and resilient and innovative economy. And if we do get some agreement on this, there is the possibility that we could turn this, really turn this thing around. Uh, any other economy, I think, might have failed or, or have uh, fumbled the ball much more strongly by now, but this economy has been able to hold on this long. So it's given us some more time. Uh, but it's not going to give us a lot more time. Gene. You know, the bill is cajoled us, to be honest, and I'm all of a sudden beginning to understand the nature of a political dilemma because honesty would compel me to tell you that I, I'm not honorable and I've never been honorable. It's <laughs> 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 really that doesn't sound right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I think the good news is that the bad news isn't all that bad. I mean, this, these issues we're talking about in terms of the budget are not issues of major war, although we are in a war. We're not, you know, we're not facing the crises of a depression or a World War II uh, or, or many other crises we've ever in, in the past. And even our economy has, has been through this mild, mild recession. We've so far done pretty well. It's done very well over the last 20 years. And what we're largely talking about is a straitjacket we tie around ourselves in terms of the future promises we made. So we're really talking about loosening that straight checker. We're not talking about spending less on health or spending less on retirement. We're just saying get a little under control so that we have the flexibility to do the things we need to do as a nation. So in some sense, the good news is that the dilemma is not really a real dilemma in terms of, of things that are happening to us yet so much, although there, there, yes, there are bad things, but, but not worse than a lot of things that happen historically. It's that it's a straight track and we just need, we just need to loosen the straight track and loosen up some of these promises we make for the future so we have flexibility to proceed. So the good news is the bad news is it isn't necessarily all that bad. Yeah, to me the good news is there's very few of us that are looking to buy one-way tickets out of America or someplace else where it's better and the problems are easier. Like my ancestors did, my folks came over from Sweden in the late 1800s, so let's keep it in proper perspective. And this honorable business, you know, again, when you represent West Texas, you learn real quick if you're not honorable, you're Charlie. <laughs> and you understand that you've got BS, MS, PhD after your name, we all understand what BS is. MS is more the same, and PhD is piled higher and deeper. That's the philosophy that we try to bring into the budget. Social Security. With, with those that, uh, you know, we, we think we're smarter than we are, that's the problem. Bill. Yeah. I just want to pick up from what Leon said. The one thing that really impresses me that I'm very optimistic about is this year's election in the sense of the young people 
that are involved. I got involved in governmental because of the admonition from John F. Kennedy. I have the same kind of sense that the young people are getting re-engaged. There was a time while I was on the Hill that young people were not interested in government. They were not interested in public affairs. They were interested in going to Wall Street and making money. I have a feeling that there's a generation that's coming out of this election like it was in the 60s. Let's do, let's, let's get involved, let's understand, let's be a contributor to finding solutions to these problems. I think that's a positive message that comes out of this year's election. And just in case anybody's getting too optimistic, don't forget that your government just borrowed $100 million while they were answering that question. <laughs> um, are there questions from the, from the audience? And can I ask that everybody identify themselves there's a mic coming to you. Did you get that mic? Did you talk? Sorry. Okay. Um, I'm Lindsay Wertheim. I run an energy seminar series called The Energy Conversation, which is now being supported totally across government to expose people to understand. Well, I, I think we have an energy illiterate nation, so the idea is to open the aperture. But I have a different question. Um, my concern about the way we educate, think, and perform in government is for one-off solutions. And so my question is, where do we get, how do we start doing what I call consequence management? What are the second, third, fourth, fifth order consequences of all these smart choices you folks make, or the leadership announces? Every solution we make or take sets up the conditions for the next problem. And in this globalized world, if we don't understand how this ripples through and how it's likely to come back and bite us, so this is really a new way of asking questions. We have an educational system that says, answer the question. They don't get them to ask the right ones. I think these are really tough problems, and leadership needs to start raising them and perhaps getting other people to think through if we make this choice, then what happens? Dead silence. <laughs> well, well but, uh, but, I, mean, I, I think that really is the challenge uh, that, that faces uh, a new president in trying to deal with this issue. Uh, this, you know, in many ways, what has to happen here is that uh, dealing with uh, the depths of dealing with uh, budget issues uh, has to be uh, a political issue that is raised during the campaign. I have to tell you, part of the reason we were able to engage in the 90 budget agreement was because Ross Perot made this an issue for the country. Uh, and to, to a large extent, uh, Bill Clinton responded with his economic plan because of what Ross Perot had done during that campaign making the deficit an issue. So it has to become a political issue so that the public not only recognizes the problems associated with it, but that those who are running for political office recognize that this is one of the issues that they have to address. Uh, the second part of that is that if a president wants to address this issue, president has to have a way of uh, presenting this to the American people as to why this needs to be done. Uh, and too often, this issue is avoided because of the hard choices that are involved here. But uh, the fact is, the reason politicians don't deal with this issue is because the choices are generally unpopular. You've got to cut spending, you've got to raise taxes. Uh, and if you're going to do that, you have to put that in the context of why is this necessary for the future of this country? Why does it relate to our future economic security? Why does it relate to our future national security? Why does it relate to uh, our ability to be able to invest in those things for the future? The president has to turn that corner uh, and, and be able to speak to those issues. And unless that happens, by the way, the next president isn't able to do that with the American people. We can talk, these guys up here on the stage can talk all we want. Nothing's going to happen and nothing's going to change. So to your point, I think unless a president is able to say why, why we have to do this and relate it to the future, 
then uh, I, I don't think much is going to change. You think Congress doesn't have a role in that? It comes from one person? I think that the president has a bully pulpit and plays a very important role in getting the public to put pressure on the Congress. Yes, Congress has a role. Yes, there are leaders in the Congress that can try to provide that direction. But let me tell you something. If the President of the United States isn't laying that groundwork, it isn't going to happen. When I was in Congress, I mean, during the Reagan administration, uh, just to give you an example, if Ronald Reagan went out there and made a speech, uh, my phone didn't have email in those days. Uh, my phones were ringing off the book because he had the ability to get his name across the American people. Uh, you need to have a president to be able to do that. Question right here. Sorry, it's like I'm going to kind of follow up on that. I'm Sally Atwood, and I serve as executive director of the President's Committee for people with intellectual disabilities, which was formerly mental retardation. Um, it's a policy committee. One of the things that we've looked at, we've reviewed other policy, and it's a great concern, is that there are over 200 programs within the different federal agencies of government that overlap. We want to keep a safety net for our population, but you know, we need to do more even for them and get them back to work. And Congress throughout the years created this. And so, you know, it almost needs to be reinvented. I'll just make a quick quick answer to that, and that that's that's absolutely right. And, you know, I think a uh, kind of a Hoover Commission to look at various aspects of government is a good way to go about it. But don't forget, each of those programs came about because Congress created them, because there was a special interest group out there that wanted their program covered. No. There has to be the resistance to that. that. By the way, that's true in a number of areas. It's not just true in your area. I mean, if you look at, hey, one of the real problems we had at OMB and the budget committee when we were working is every time we try to consolidate these programs, every time we try to make sense of these programs, Every time you try to get rid of the programs that don't work anymore, you run immediately into political barriers for those people that basically have defended those programs over the years. So this is this is one of the areas that you absolutely have to include in a comprehensive budget proposal is trimming down those areas and coordinating and combining those programs so that they work more effectively. Yeah, but Washington is, is only now exists for lobbyists and associations or interest groups. I mean, if you ask anybody here, I bet they represent some group. <laughs> I just wanted to give real just a cross-section of reactions. Uh, Senator Conrad had talked about doing a commission trying to vote this year. He's recently said he will not, uh, does not expect to do that. I know the idea of a commission to deal with entitlements and taxes has been an idea that's been kicked around. But uh, how's the idea that he can't even seem to put forward that idea this year, strike you guys as, as a good thing or a bad thing for the outlook? I think, I mean, generally, I think we supported that uh, approach of trying to establish the commission. Uh, and, and you know, I guess speaking for myself, I'll take anything that, uh, that represents uh, an effort to try to deal with this issue. I, I feel the same way, uh, Senator Weinovich, uh, Representative Wolf, uh, others uh, have uh, similar competing ideas. Uh, I think they're all of them could be useful. Uh, a lot of commissions are not successful. Very few of them are, but, but they're one more effort in trying to move the ball down the field. And, and in as much as uh, every now and then one works, uh, I think they ought to be encouraged. I'll just add to that, that, is a, it's a, that most of us do support this idea of a commission. And I think it's highly discouraging that it looks like it's not going to move forward this year. Um, 
you know, commission in some ways is almost a punch. It is Congress saying we don't want to make the hard choices, so we're going to bring together people to help us do that. And that's necessary in these very challenging issues like we have right now. But when you can't even put, you know, that on the agenda, uh, it goes back to our first principle. We have to stop and admit that we have a problem. Can I just add? Yeah, please. I mean, it's very important, I think, when you establish a commission that you give a lot of thought time to establish a commission. We had two commissions during the last eight years, and I think they were very badly formulated in the way they were set up. In particular, if you have a commission, I think it has to come out with one set of proposals. You can't come out with four or five options because, because that's, not, that's not guiding Congress to make tough choices. But I think you also have to have a commission people who really understand the issues. I had the honor of serving with these two gentlemen who co-chaired or, or two of the co-chairs of the commission. Uh, National, next week had two names, National Commission on Retirement Policy and the CSIS Commission. But we dealt with a lot of nitty gritty issues as well. Like, okay, if you do this, what's that gonna do for you? More people retire, so let's establish a minimum benefit. And, we, and you've gotta be able to deal with some of these tougher issues too. It's not just picking items off of a laundry list. So I think there's a lot of details in how you design the commission. Even then the probability might be that it's not gonna fail, but you can increase the probability of success by really, by really planning it well. Yeah, just, let, let me just make this point. Uh, I, I mean, commissions usually take place when either the president or the Congress want to deal with the issues. So you establish a commission to try to give you the answers and you hope that then you, know, you can either delay the problem long enough so you still don't have to face it, or uh, ultimately you try to pick up some of the recommendations. I really do think that, uh, I guess what I would hope is that the next president is smart enough to recognize that probably the first thing you have to do is reestablish trust with the leadership in the Congress and with the key players in Congress and bring them together in an effort to try to address these issues. Uh, that really hasn't happened for a long time. And I guess I would recommend that the president at least take that step first before throwing his ball to the commission. Right here. Chuck Bubba, uh, I'm wondering whether we should focus on the hypocrisy that we have now with the federal government imposing on the private sector the present value accounting for ERISA plans so that it won't have to bail them out, so that they will be, you know, they will have to be fiscally sound plans, but it won't impose any kind of present value accounting on itself. I don't mean in obscure budget documents. You see these estimates in budget documents. But I mean in the budget process itself, in terms of points of order and reconciliation bills, um, to deal with the federal government's own irresponsible commitments to its long-term plans. Um, and I ask this because I was the staff author of the Lieberman Bill in 2003 that would have brought President Biden County directly in the budget process instead of focusing on useful but very limited measures like cash accounting, annual budget deficits that give you essentially no information about the long-term commitments, which are, I mean, they're, they're 60 or 80 trillion dollars uh, compared to 500 billion dollars. I mean, that's twice the net worth of the United States uh, that we're dealing with here in terms of unfunded liabilities. Rudy. Uh, well, I certainly admire the effort you undertook with uh, Senator Lieberman. And the more different ways we can explain this problem, uh, the better. But I do think the real problem right now is the cash flow problem as opposed to a present value problem. That is to say, if we really go on with historical tax burdens and that we do not reform any of these programs, the deficit, the deficit itself just becomes gargantuan uh, before 2030 sometime. And that, I think, is, is what is going to cause the financial crisis if we really don't do anything about it. Uh, reforming the major spending program. I do think where you're right, Chuck, is the process has to deal with the long-term budget equally or first, mm -hmm. as opposed to the short-term budget, as opposed to fixing the short-term budget and always leaving the long-term budget in balance, whether you do it your way or other ways. I think I think that type of movement is correct. Chuck, you know that we worked together on it. We tried. I think there was some positive action. But there are also some issues to get back into the gimmick issues, as you know. What is the discount rate? How are you going to specify and you know, all kinds of difficulties? Also, would say that one unfunded liability is a piece of the front page of the 
yesterday, yesterday, the 80, some people estimated $85 trillion. You get to the point where the number is so large that you can just, there's a lot. You not, you lose their focus. So I think that, I think you're right, I think we have to focus on it, but I don't think it's the answer. I want to agree with Rudy on the cash. We've got a cash flow problem and remind us all that right now with energy cost oil at $125 a barrel, we have about $625 billion a year outflowing from the United States. If it goes to $150 a barrel, which it very well can, we'll have $900 billion. That is going to exacerbate some of our cash flow problems in a lot of ways as far as how anybody deals with this. We should have dealt with energy 10 years ago. We did. We're now paying dearly for our inability to meet our energy needs in a realistic way. Exactly the same way we are doing Social Security. Yes. Good morning. I'm Robert Cohen, Asian American Chamber. Um, you all alluded to the um, <coughs> So this new energy, some of the youth, it sounds like the high school, college students are focusing on campaigns here. My question has to deal with um, management of expectations, and you're dealing with a group that, uh, frankly, has uh, been dealing with $3 uh, gallon gas, um, and also uh, they haven't really uh, tackled on some of the health care prices that they're not sort of out in the real world. Um, how do you get them ingrained as to what the, um, I think on, on, on energy, what should be sort of a fair price, and then on health care, um, um, you know, what the real cost of that is to them. Thank you. You know, I, I might say that I, I think one of the problems that I've, I've seen, you know, that renewal in uh, young people and that interest, uh, and I've been, we've been tracking it, uh, we actually started our institute because I was concerned about young people not being interested. But uh, the polls we've taken lately, it's clear that, that there is uh, there's a millennial generation out there uh, that has the potential to become a reform generation. Uh, but I think if, it, if this is going to change, it really, it really demands honesty with regards to the threats that we're facing and how we're going to deal with it. And I, what I see happening in the presidential campaign is again this kind of traditional approach to the campaign where presidents basically address all or candidates address these issues and make it seem like it's pretty simple to solve all these problems that we're confronting uh, or that they have a simple answer to deal with them. And the fact is that there really are no simple answers to any of these issues. Uh, it's going to involve a lot of sacrifice. And I guess what I would prefer is that the candidates be a lot more honest with the American people about just exactly what we are confronting. I mean, the Iraq War, for example, comes down to a debate about whether we have victory or whether we have withdrawal. There's a lot more complicated issues there that are not being talked about. Uh, the issues of uh, on energy uh, are a lot more complicated. The fact is we're going to rely, we're going to have to rely on oil and coal for a long time in this country as, as a source of energy. That's not being talked about. It's almost like we can suddenly, suddenly go to alternatives very quickly. Uh, so I guess it, you know, it would really help if we could have an honest debate about the choices that have to be made uh, and the costs that are going to be associated with those. That would be a very good beginning. Because my fear is that this reform generation uh, we'll suddenly think that we can solve all of these problems and they'll find when we go into a new administration that we're having a hard time solving any of these problems and they could be frustrated by that. I want to just comment to that because I think the whole generational perspective of this issue is, is such a compelling and driving force in it um, and I can't resist telling one quick story about a number of years ago, I was poll tested while I was speaking and no one bothered to tell me. And they did this little dial test and there was a picture of my numbers catapulting down. And when they were analyzing it, they said, you're not very soft and fuzzy when you're talking. You keep talking about actuarial balance and nobody cares. And frankly, as a woman, you've got to learn to talk about this differently. Can you please talk about your children? Because this is about the next generation. And I said, at the time it was true, I have no children. 
and they said, can you please hold up pictures of somebody else's children? <laughs> So now that I have my own because I will still spare you photos of them. Um, but it is, you know, with all the economic ramifications of what's going on, so much of this does have an effect on younger voters uh, and the next generation. Nonetheless, as somebody who in my 20s, I spent a lot of time trying to get younger voters really interested in these issues. You have to be realistic. It's not going to happen. We're not going to have the million 20 something, million person 20 something vote on Washington because younger voters are going to care about lots of different issues education, um, energy, the environment, the different things that matter to them. And the point is that deficit reduction will never be a special interest group. There will not be a demographic that focuses on it, there will not be a lobbying constituency. Um, it is going to have to be a public interest issue, which is put on the agenda, I think, through leadership. We're not going to be able to put it there from outside forces as much as really building an understanding in the country so that they accept when a leader does come forward and puts it on the national agenda. That's, that's how I see it happening. Another question, yeah. Darris from the European Commission delegation. Um, I think it was uh, John Maynard Keynes, as we all know, said, um, in the long run, we're all dead. I'm not sure it was Yogi Berra, but whoever, Milton well, Friedman or whoever, after Keynes had died, said, well, Keynes is dead and we're all, we're in the long run now. So my question to you is, first of all, are we in the long run yet? It's my view that we're, if we're not quite there, we're pretty darn close to it. And in that context, how do you judge, um, some of you, all of you, the recent very, I would judge, short-term, um, you know, programs of the Congress and the White House. First of all, the very expensive 160 billion or whatever stimulus package, and more um, stimulus, fiscal stimulus attached to various bills that we're seeing now, and then the um, the FHA bill, the Housing Relief Bill, coming in. These are designed to, of course, you know, cushion the blow, get us out of recession we're in now. Um, but how does how do you view that? How has this sort of changed the perspective on, on policy, this very short term? Jim? Well, I think we are close to the long term. Mm -hmm. um, I, I uh, you know, looking back on my career in Congress in 20, starting 23 years, 24 years ago, I am watching it up today. You can begin to you can see this thing mounting. I mean, there were elements of a plan before that, having created many of these programs. But you really began to see the cost, and they've been escalating very rapidly since that time. And I think we're very close to a point, a tipping point, where it's going to be very difficult for us to turn back. Each year that we go without making these changes and these reforms, it gets more expensive. The fixes get tougher, politically tougher, and they get more costly. As Charlie and I found that out each year when we had to reintroduce our bill. Uh, the, dynamics of the Social Security had changed, so we had to tweak things a little bit. The changes in terms of cutting benefits or raising taxes had to go up or had to go down accordingly. And uh, it just gets harder and harder. So I think we are close to a typical point. You look at the kinds of things that Congress is doing today, whether you're talking about things you cited, the FHA, the, uh, the, the farm bill, the economic stimulus going back to the prescription drug program, We've created a lot of these entitlement programs. We've added to them. We've made it a lot more difficult for us. And I think it's going to take a generation, which what worries me is we've raised a generation of young people that are in the mean now, now generation, that they want you know, instant gratification. Uh, and and uh, actually, a lot of older people, senior people, want instant gratification too. Uh, so it's going to be, this is going to be tough to do. This is not going to be easy. I think the long run is definitely here. The first baby to America has applied for Social Security. Yep. I saw her picture in the newspaper. Uh, the first one will apply uh, for um, Medicare 2011. Uh, if you look at the CBO budget projections, if the next president is lucky enough to serve eight years, uh, they'll see uh, unreformed Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, going up by about one and a half percent of the GDP. Finance that is a tax increase, it's an eight percent tax increase, which won't be popular. Finance it by cutting all other non-interest programs in the government. That's a 15% cut across the board. Um, 
That's before you do any of these wonderful initiatives that we're hearing about in the presidential campaign. So um, it is my view, and others have said this, that unless we face these problems, the next president is going to be handcuffed. There's not much that he or she is going to be able uh, to do uh, with respect to all of the campaign problems they've been making. Gene. Well, I hate to use arbitrary lines like century dividing lines, but I, but I think that we have come to the end of several multi-decade trends. Uh, the baby boomers entering the workforce and filling the ranks of the elderly now we're, now we're on the backside of that. Uh, the women entering the workforce, which actually provided a huge number of, of workers in the economy, even as people kept retiring earlier and earlier, that's pretty much ended. We've had this shift basically since World War II from about 14, 15 percentage points of GDP being paid for defense, switching down to even with the Iraq War at about four percentage points. That allowed a trillion dollars per year increase or more in domestic spending. <coughs> that's really ended. I think you've seen growth in government as an earlier uh, question you're asking about, about all the multiple programs we have in government. The government just grows by adding program after program after program. You know, you, you have this notion that that, that that period's ended. And I think we're going to go through, it's not just a one year change. I think we're in the midst of some very, very fundamental changes of which in some ways the deficit is the residual from all sorts of these complications. And then we, so we get numbers now that say things like the future president really just commented on this has no flexibility in the budget. I testified once and I just showed the projected growth in healthcare over four years absorbed something like half of all the revenues, the several hundred billion dollars of revenues that were gonna grow. So you have all these pre-commitments now absorbing things without the growth of the labor force due to the women and the, uh, and the baby boomers without the defense budget being that big of a source of revenue, of, of, of revenues even if you got rid of the Iraq war. So all these trends are sort of coming to a head and, you know, in some ways we can talk about this as a problem, but I also think it's a really exciting time to think about the government. It's going to be making these multi-trillion dollar decisions. It has to. And how we do it and how we think about reforming social policy. This is just a government that doesn't exist to reduce its deficit. You know, we're going to go through some really fundamental changes. And I think we can do some things as well. We just, we just think them out well. Well, I think that's right. I think crisis focuses a line on it. I and mean, I think that prices are building up here dramatically to where the leaders are going to have a hard time ignoring them. And, um, and so uh, I do strongly support Leon's point about the importance of the presidency for leadership. Uh, and then there's always the people that, that uh, the president points to the key positions. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, Dick Nixon had not gotten Mel Laird. Uh, in a secondary defense, I think we'd still maybe be in the jungles of Vietnam fighting away, hoping for a victory at some point in time. At the same time, I think if Jack Kennedy had picked Bob Lovett for his secondary defense, maybe instead of McNamara, we never would have gone into that, uh, uh, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, uh, key leadership really is key, and they've got to be able to articulate it to the uh, public. But uh, I always remember working on the New York City fiscal crisis when nothing, no city in the world was in a bigger funk than New York City when Wall Street wouldn't uh, sell any more bonds for them. And, um, and uh, all construction came to a, all the real estate values went in half. And um, one of the heroes was uh, Governor Kerry, who had a monthly meeting. And he had all the players there, the unions, the bankers, the civil servants, uh, everybody there, and he would say to them, you can't leave until we make the tough decisions because we had too many years where we talked about all the issues, but we left the meetings and nothing got done. And he bailed that thing out for less than three years. I was hired, I was in the private sector at the time, I was hired by the Secretary of Treasury, uh, Bill Simon, to go out and sort out the financial condition of New York City because of Congress wrote the uh, bailout legislation. They um, said that the Secretary of the Treasury had to certify that New York City could repay the loan every time he gave them a piece of the loan. And as Simon figured out, he didn't even know anything about the condition of the New York City Bank. So anyway, we went out there, we had 40 people, we had to do it in a very short period of time. We delivered the report, and I said to the 40 people uh, that worked on that project, I said, how many of you think uh, New York City will be able to repay this loan. 
Not a single hand went up, and they were all wrong because of Governor Terry's leadership and of the people who recognized that they had to make the tough decisions. And I think we've come into that in a series of areas here, much of which we talked about today. Tim Clark from Government Executive Magazine. Uh, last week I went to a uh, forum put on by CQ uh, where there were eight uh, people sitting on the uh, stage uh, and they talked with a great deal of passion uh, at putting aside the interest that had divided them before uh, about the need to uh, meet a $1.7 trillion investment in infrastructure in this country. Uh, the defense establishment in this country uh, it, it believes it could use, needs much more money than it is getting. The Air Force is advertising now to that effect. Uh, the Defense Department needs money to reset its current force, to modernize its systems, and to expand uh, the number of troops in the Army and, and Marine Corps. We need to invest in energy, I think I've heard it said here uh, on this panel. So there's a lot, even though we're spending at the record levels, and spending has been increasing, there's a lot of pent-up demand out there for more spending. And uh, so I would ask you on the panel, how are we going to deal with that? Uh, you are, are speaking in what is widely viewed as abstractions, as Maya said. There's no constituency, no special interest group for deficit reduction. But there is a uh, real need perceived out there by various constituencies for more spending. How, how are we going to handle that? I, you know, you know, the only way we've been able to deal with this issue over the years is because, in the end, it, you really, you know, it's, it's not a choice between uh, you know, spending on priorities or fiscal discipline, uh, fiscal responsibility. The fact is, both can work together. Now, budgets are about priorities. Uh, when you develop a budget, you've got to decide, you know, what are the priorities you're going to spend on? What are the, what are the areas where you're not going to spend on? What are the areas you're going to cut back on? Uh, what are the areas you're going to pay for uh, in terms of the future? You know, when I first sat down with Bill Clinton when we were working out the economic plan, uh, you know, Clinton kept raising the question, well, wait, what about education? What about health care? What about you know uh, science and research? What about the areas that I that I care about campaign on? And we as budget uh, people had to basically say, look, you know these are the areas we're going to achieve savings in. This is how we're going to make room for your priorities and your investments. This is how we're going to pay for some of that, so that in the end we could say you could do this in a fiscally responsible way. Uh, you know yes, there are needs out there. But it doesn't mean that you have to blow uh, your everything else up in order to deal with those needs. And, and that, I mean, that's what's disappointed me, frankly, in the last few years, is every time there's a need that somebody identifies, everybody says, let's put a lot of money into it. Nobody cares about how you pay for it. Nobody cares about who's going to you know, carry the bill. Uh, you just basically borrow the money to deal with it. Uh, and, and it hasn't been done in the context of any kind of, of fiscal responsibility, which you know amazes me, frankly, because my Republican friends generally used to beat the hell out of me when I was chairman of the budget uh, if we didn't try to establish a kind of fiscal discipline overall. Uh, that discipline has not been there, and, and it's not there, frankly, on either side. And that, that I think, is what we're trying to change. Doesn't mean you have to give up on your priorities. It doesn't mean you don't you, you can't invest in these areas for the future. But it does mean that you're going to have to make some hard decisions about where you cut and where you raise revenue. Jim. Can I just add one thing very quickly? Uh, my last six years in Congress, I was chairman of the Foreign Operations Subcommittee of Appropriations. Uh, and since then, I've been very active and involved in the development of the community here and the foreign assistance community. How long ago I gave a speech to the Society for International Development, which is the trade group from all the umbrella group from all the development stuff. And I said, look, I'm going to talk to you today about something that you probably have never heard about here. Everybody usually comes and talks about more money for development, more money for assistance. I said, unless you get involved in this battle over entitlements and reforming entitlements, there isn't going to be any for you. There isn't going to be any increase. 
fact, there's going to have to be a tremendous shrinking of this. And I think that's the reality. We have to go to the, we have to go to these people, these groups, and say you've got to get involved in this, and it has to be on talking about this entire program. Uh, Jane referred to the diverse group that put together this report recently, but the key problem that, that we identified was that so much of the budget is on automatic pilot. Yeah. That the three big programs, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, just keep getting worse and worse and worse uh, without any action by the Congress whatsoever. And it was our whole point that they had to be put on a more level playing field with things like infrastructure. Uh, the Congress had to do more voting explicitly about where they saw those programs going. And uh, our group would have enforced that with the trigger mechanism that would automatically cut them if uh, they exceeded some sort of speed limit. I think that's what you have to do, otherwise you can't talk about infrastructure sensibly or any of the other many things that we would like to do as a society because these things are just sweeping us out. Uh, they're on automatic pilot and the pilots fly up into a mountain of death and sickness. Well, a living example of tough choice just happened last week with the Blue Dogs demanding that the GI Bill shall be paid for. Now they caught heck predictably on that one. They were right, and in the end, it's a perfectly good example of what is going to need to be done on some of these other tough, tough issues next year. But that's a that's a very positive example, I believe, of pay go and biting a tough bullet in an area that's not very uh, couldn't be running for re-election on November. Yeah. Now, I, I also think it's fair to point out that there probably has never been a time in our history when uh, units of government could not cite uh, acres of unmet needs. I have never seen a department where the salt didn't want its budget doubled or trebled or quadrupled. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that's a good thing for the country that that should happen. <clears throat> what we're trying to do is, is get the decision makers to make some choices. Uh, if, if they want a new airplane, it's okay. Maybe they need a little less ethanol. Uh, but somebody's got to do that. And uh, the situation is not new. Uh, we, we are not an informed country. We have a strong economy. We have a, uh, a well-fed population, which is uh, living at, at a standard that no nation has ever enjoyed before. And uh, everybody does not need more, particularly the departments of government. Um, oh, Chuck, please. Yeah, I can give you a very good example of that, and that is my first budget at the Defense Department was under McNamara, and he had a fallacious view that the country could uh, afford whatever they needed in, in, in for defense. Uh, and so the services, just as uh, Bill points out, they served up $120 billion of requests and told them it wasn't enough. That they were just being kind when they gave the $120 billion listing, see. Uh, Laird comes in uh, a year later and we do the budget on a different basis. He gives the fiscal guidance to the uh, services. $3 billion maybe above what he is going to uh, cut. And uh, so we had, to, we had to make the tough decisions at the service level. And, uh, and then after he gave that, he had expenditure cuts. I remember Governor Chafee, who was now Secretary of the Navy, said to me, a billion dollars we got to cut. And, and I said, that's right. He said, well, the budget of Rhode Island was only 390 million. He said, this will be a new experience for me. But anyway, we had to do that for three years. And you know, what happened was we redid the, uh, the defense uh, department. That's one of Larry's great genius. And he not only got us out of Vietnam, but he constrained the defense down to a modern, very effective um, a fighting force, uh, but it took 10 years. Uh, and uh, and the, the tough decisions were made down uh, uh, at the level that the military that knew what they were doing, and they loved them for it. They hated McNamara, which was giving them twice as much money. Uh, so you know it was a it was a sea change. That's the kind of sea change we need in uh, several of the major areas here. Just as Rudy's pointed out, in other words, you got to make some 
tough choices here in uh, some of these areas, but uh, the decision makers have to get in, and you want to get the people who really know the area well to make those uh, decisions. And um, and it's doable. I'm convinced it's doable. I just I want to comment on it as well because I think it's such an important question. If you think about what's going on in the rest of this hotel, probably half the other rooms are filled with people having panels saying about why what they want to spend money on, whether it's tax cuts or new spending, is so critically important. Um, and actually, Jeff Birnbaum in the Washington Post today did a, a little write-up on this new project saying, isn't it different to have a group of people who are out there talking about what we shouldn't have? I feel like we're being called to a wedding dinner or something. <laughs> um, you know, different. it's so different to have a group of people talking about what we shouldn't have instead of what we do have, uh, instead of what we want to have paid for. Um, I also deal with kind of a similar dynamic at the think tank where I work, where all my colleagues have wonderful, wonderful ideas. And they come into my office and they say, look at what I thought of on X or Y, and I always play, play the Grinch, where I say, that's great, how are you going to play, pay for it? And you know, they leave my office and don't come back. Um, and I've often thought that pay-go for think tanks would not be a bad idea. We have so many good ideas out there, nobody wants to talk about how to pay for them. And I think it's certainly true, if you look at our budget, it will be hard to argue that we don't need to shift our priorities. We, are, we have a federal budget that focuses far more on consumption than investment. There are lots of under areas of underinvestment that we should probably think about shifting resources to. But the bottom line is in order to do so, we have to talk about cutting government spending or raising other taxes. Um, you know, the, this whole, the whole point of our principles paper is that this is not a group of politically naive people, and we are not asking politicians to go out there and walk the plank and come forward with specific details of every plan that they should have to fix the budget. Uh, but we are ask, asking that when they want to spend more money, they're equally specific about how they would pay for it as how they would spend new dollars. So I think that's a pretty good starting point. And the bottom line is that anything worth doing is worth paying for. So, you know, hopefully people will push back in all the great ways we could spend money and say, how should we pay for it? I think we have time for one last question. Yeah, for you. Thank you. I'm Pete Jones from Brookings, and I want to laud the group for your effort, and I wish you success, but I'm a bit skeptical. I think the problem is the American public. Groups like yours have been trying for 20 years to wake them up and have them recognize the severity of the problem. And if you look at public opinion polls, I don't see any evidence that the public sides with you and is willing to raise their taxes or cut their programs to achieve the goals that you endorse. So my question is, what are you doing that's different? What are you doing that's new that is now going to wake up the public, persuade these candidates that you're right, fiscal discipline really is a higher priority than another spending program or tax reform? And I'd like to know what you're going to do that's going to work this time that hasn't worked before. I'd like a tipping point model. This is the year that everything's going to change. But we'll see if some of the panelists have, uh, have ideas for how it's going to work this year. But, you know, I, I think the fact that uh, members of Congress that are here uh, who have always been you know, tough on, on budget issues were able to go back to our constituencies. Uh, and be able to say to them that it was important to do this uh, and get reelected in the process. Why? Because I think in, in large measure, uh, the public deep down knows that this is a problem. Uh, you may be right, they don't like to hear it, and they may like to have, you know, as we all do, like to figure out that are easier ways to deal with it. But deep down, most families, most people understand that you can't uh, just simply continue to borrow and spend. You can't just continue operating with huge debts because they know it would, it, it would hurt their family and their business that they're involved in. And generally, when I went back to my district, uh, you know, I, I, I was pretty upfront because I was chairman of the budget committee, so I had to you know, basically tell them the, the tough choices that needed to be made. They didn't always agree with me. I had constituencies that opposed a lot of the things that I, I did. But on the other hand, I think they largely respected the fact that uh, I was honest with them about the challenge that, uh, that faces us. And I guess to some extent, what we're trying to do is to say to the candidates, be honest with your American people about the problems that are facing. Because deep down, they know that this is a problem. 
And you know, e even though there are always the constituencies that will say, just tell us what we'd like to hear. I think most of, the, most of the American people know, as a result of the economic crisis we're in, as a result of seeing the kind of huge problems that face us in the future, that this is an issue that has to be addressed. So I think this can be a politically popular issue if you're tough enough to be honest with people about how serious it is. It's about leadership. <coughs> All these people that are here in Congress got elected saying they were going to go to Washington and fix these tough problems. I said earlier that I think our part of the problem is just what you were saying, the public. We're living in the, in the moment, living in the now generation. But these leaders, these people were elected and saying they were going to fix the tough problems. It's about leadership, saying, okay, I'm going back there, and I am going to fix these tough problems. Charlie and I are sitting up here. We dealt with the social security problem. We bought my political advisors and said, don't, don't touch that. It's politically dangerous. Don't bother with it. It's not going to happen. Do something else. But I think you have to do these kinds of things. You know, I, and you can do them and you can politically survive. It's about giving a little backbone to these people who are elected to Congress. Yeah, what's, what's the blue dog? So the, they're, the challenge, I mean, they, they're kind of like the blue dog chasing bugs. Next year they caught that dude. Now, what are you going to do about it? We all know the problem. You know, all the years I had the privilege of representing the 17th district, every time anybody came into my office asking for more money for a very worthwhile program, I always asked them one question Can you help me find a way to pay for it? I will never tell anybody that you told me that's a program that could be cut within your sphere. Don't go cut somebody else, but find something within your sphere of specialty, your self-interest, that you believe could be spent better by doing what you're asking to do. <coughs> Never have a table. So the, the, finger pointing, the finger pointing is one that we're all good at. And I was reminded, when you point a finger at somebody else saying it's your fault, there's always three pointing back at you. The philosophy for all of us is, I'll give you my best shot. And boy, I make folks mad from time to time. But then you give me your three best shots back, and we'll stand, stay standing. That's kind of the way that Jim and I worked on Social Security. Look, there's a problem. Twelve years ago, we talked about this the, the long term. Twelve years ago, when I stood over Cindy's and my first grandson, birth, his birthday, and Jim and I were working on Social Security then, I resolved at that time that I didn't want that little fella to look back 68 years from that day and say, if only my granddad would have done what in his heart he knew he should have done when he was in the Congress, we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. Now, we didn't accomplish that when I was in Congress, but all of us collectively in what we're talking about today and the leadership of the future had better start resolving that for our grandchildren or be prepared to tell them we failed a tough look for you, honey. <laughs> <laughs>